Hello, everyone. Uh, this is Rock Solid Components with TypeScript and GraphQL. Um, my name is Matt Warger. I'm here from Kansas City. Um, and today, uh, we're going to be discussing a few things and techniques and tools that I've used as a professional coder or software developer. Um, so first off, a little background. Um, I've been doing software development for a while, and um, I basically started off doing Java, server-side Java development with Java EE um, and Spring. And uh, I got familiar with how you do APIs and use data to communicate with client applications. From there, I moved to .NET. And with .NET, I ended up liking it a bit better and uh, was more introduced to MVC, right? Um, enabling uh, server-side applications to render pages, server-rendered pages. Um, I had a bit of experience using JSPs, um, but this was when I really started to connect the um, you know, back into the front end in my mind. And uh, that got along pretty well. I ended up enjoying it. From that time forward, I started to get introduced to JavaScript concepts. And so, you know, moving a bit from the back end to the front end, exploring how uh, JavaScript could make pages more interactive, right? Adding a little, um, you know, form validations here or there. Um, feedback based on uh, API requests or toast notifications, little you know niceties and UX improvements. Uh, in addition to what were up then, up to then, my experience you know with server rendered pages. Um, and this was really kind of changed my view on how applications could be made. Right, I was able to do all sorts of neat uh, kind of component driven models, especially as I started learning more and more about things like AngularJS, right, the old Angular, or uh, using things like Knockout or Backbone. Libraries like that introduced this, you know, the, the beginnings of the single page application um, and the frameworks that would kind of grow up around that approach. Uh, and it was incredibly freeing. I was like, you know, this is the greatest thing that I could uh, imagine not being so beholden to the server render page model, having these kind of strict templates that I had to output, really being able to kind of express the things that I wanted to, um, you know, even if they were just, you know, trivial uh, form validations, right? It, it, it enabled me a level of freedom that I really enjoyed. I kept going though. And I started running into what I thought were I don't know, issues as far as what you really, what you want uh, your users to experience versus how you're coding the app. And I kept running into issues and um, roadblocks, right? They ended up looking like this. And if you've developed front-end applications, these you know red boxes in the browser kind of pop up to you during your normal dev cycle. Right, you can't access an undefined uh, property of an undefined object, for example. You end up running into these things, and JavaScript is great. It allows for this level of dynamic development, but at, at the same time, you know that level of freedom comes with being able to just randomly access properties. And unless you're really careful, you end up running into this problem, right? And you run into enough it can get pretty frustrating. That frustration essentially made me consider you know, my past. And at that time, I looked back at how when I was developing you know, MVC applications, for example, I didn't run into this issue. You know, why was that? That led me to think more about how I can you know, start improving my front-end development experience to still allow that dynamic single-page application model while also, you know, having a bit of structure that I, I had when everything kind of came from the server, was driven by the structures and types that uh, were available to me uh, with server frameworks, right? 
that really opened my eyes, allowed me to see the light to um, this better way of developing applications. And throughout this talk, I hope to kind of give you a, an overview. Um, we won't get too much into the weeds um, simply because of time. Uh, I can't go too deep on any one thing, but what I hope to do is communicate how these different approaches and tools connect together. And that connection, it can kind of spur some ideas, allow you all to um, you know, investigate uh, on your own time and realize how this might fit in to a model, right? I'm, I'm trying to relay an approach here that I think applies very well and can improve the developing development experience of a lot of people. So for the talk, um, the plan is essentially we're going to look at types. We're going to look at TypeScript specifically as a language, and we're also going to look at GraphQL. Now, I will do broad overviews of these things, um, so don't worry if you don't know exactly what these are, um, but I hope to just communicate how the pieces fit together. Um, you can dig into the pieces uh, on your own. All right, so why types? I mentioned briefly um, about how the type systems that were available with server render frameworks, right? .NET, um, Spring, you know, those uh, using Java or C Sharp, for example, you end up having languages that have classes and, you know, those classes have properties and those things are very rigid in how you can use them. Um, why would we want this? So for front end, uh, essentially, you know, the, the kind of 80-20 uh, reasoning behind this is that it becomes DNA for your data. Um, as, you know, as most applications, you know, when you when you boil down to it, essentially being list manipulation, uh, the data and the, the the properties that you're working with a lot of times are coming from a server, right? The basic CRUD functionality. How that kind of worms its way down into your application, right? derivations from that data can change, right? Can be different. But for the most part, this is kind of the goal. And what I want to get across is that these types end up being a form of documentation, right? Here's something like a React component uh, that's a button. And if you've used React, which most of the examples here will be React because I love React, um, whether you're using a component library or making your own, um, the types that you provide uh, via a language like TypeScript can essentially act as documentation. And I mean that in, in the way that you're probably used to as far as software documentation, uh, which are a good reference. But the nice part is that this also ends up being documentation for your tools and your editor, right? So whether you're using IntelliJ um, or VS Code or, or Atom, rest in peace, uh, your editor ends up getting better. And the tools that you use, your, you know, mainly your editor, uh, end up being better because they can leverage these types the same way that you can look at them and provide you a better development experience. Right, so the thing I'll keep driving home is that types equal tools. Um, that's the one foundational point uh, that, that really kind of binds this all together. So, why TypeScript? So really, TypeScript lays on a spectrum of type systems. And if you've developed with modern JavaScript frameworks, you know you're probably used to JavaScript. I would say this is essentially all the way over on the untyped uh, side of the side of the line. Now, that doesn't mean that it you know, doesn't have types. There are there are types in the language, but what I really mean is the ability to kind of soundly type uh, structures and and objects that you're working with. Now, related to this is flow types. Flow types is developed by Facebook and aims to provide a way to annotate JavaScript with types. This is um, anymore not a, a great solution. They've come out and said that they don't intend for people outside of Facebook to really leverage this technology. Although a couple of years ago, it was someone in favor on uh, many people's minds as, as a good uh, option. Um, Hegel is also a, a 
project that aims to do similarly to Flow. On the other end, we've got things like uh, Reason or uh, Rescript, uh, which is based on OCaml and, and Elm. Both of these, although not as popular, do provide a very great, uh, very sound type system. They go so far as to say that if you use their type system uh, adequately, you can actually ship apps that can't have runtime errors. And that's a strong claim, right? Because being able to say that runtime errors simply can't happen, um, that's, a, that's a tall order. Um, but when you have a type system as strong as theirs and everything, including items that may be undefined or not there, um, when all of that's encoded in the type system, you can uh, make sure, you can ensure that the uh, items that you're working with um, are um, sound enough. Right, but what we're talking about today is TypeScript. Um, and as you probably could have guessed, I believe that this is kind of the sweet spot. It's the one that's right in the middle that provides the best amount of type soundness um, that's you know a better structure than regular JavaScript, but not so confining as to limit its adoptability. And that shows through in the community and the, the way that uh, the community has adopted uh, this language so, so thoroughly and so quickly. Right, so what is TypeScript? So TypeScript is a type superset of JavaScript that compiles to plain JavaScript. And what does this actually mean? Essentially, type annotations uh, can provide advanced features and tools, and this is through TypeScript itself, that allows a better development experience. Right, so in this way, bugs that uh, can be caught at compile time instead of runtime. You know, bugs that would normally take you loading the uh, application in a browser to see can now be caught um, at compile time or in your editor, right? You end up seeing uh, red squiggles in your editor rather than giving red boxes to your users. So for a couple examples, um, and these are going to be pretty high level just to kind of get a taste for what they look like. Uh, you can have things like strings. So you can declare variables with a string. You see a colon and then the type that you want to declare it. That's uh, you know a name, Super Mario. These things uh, basically guarantee that the name will be a string. You can have objects. So you can actually declare types using the type keyword. You can set it equal to what looks like an object. Um, and you know, this is JavaScript, so this should look familiar. You basically follow the variable name with a colon and then the type, just like the previous example. Uh, and you can have other properties, right? So this would basically say that we want a game, which is an object. It's going to have a name that's a string and a score that's a number. You can combine these things together as well. So an array, for example, a game array, you can annotate by putting the brackets after the type name. And this will guarantee that it's an array of game types. Again, name is a string and the score as a number. You can also use the type of keyword. So in this case, we have a game that we've set up. It's actual variable, just a const called Rocket League Game. This has a name and a score. But for the games that we want to follow after this, we can actually infer the type of that game. So if we use the type of keyword and use the Rocket League game variable, we can actually extract a type from that object. And if we want to model other games after that type, we can use that type to then guarantee that any follow-up games that we have also conform to that type. Um, this is basically just a, I'm trying to just explain uh, the types of operators and uh, the ability of TypeScript to uh, allow you to provide types as well as infer types. This gets important for the tools that you end up using uh, when you work with a language in something like React or Angular. So what this also leads to, um, as I kind of mentioned before, was tooling assistance. 
right? If you used VS Code, um, you've probably ran into this bar when you start it up, right? It's down at the bottom, and it'll say that it's initializing JSTS language features. This is using the TypeScript language server to basically provide you some help. And this help um, can also uh, help you out with JavaScript. There are limitations to this. It allows you to get some basic autocomplete um, across uh, different components, and sometimes from one component to the other, and then component libraries that expose types. So you don't necessarily have to use TypeScript for everything, but once you do make the leap, I think you'll find that the uh, benefit is very much worth uh, the learning curve. So how would you get started with this, right? With TypeScript um, and most modern bundler kind of tool sets, right? If you're using Create React App, if you're using Vite, using Next.js, um, you can simply change your JS or JSX files to TS or TSX. And this will um, basically trigger the uh, tool set to update its config, and you can just start working with TypeScript right away. If you're using just a basic Webpack bundler, um, the instructions are also fairly straightforward, though not as simple as the pre-made bundlers tools to uh, get up and running. So at this point, um, we can talk about GraphQL. And for most listeners of, of this talk, I feel like this is probably the, the real interesting portion, right? This is probably why most are here. And it's because GraphQL, I think, is relatively new to most people's minds. Um, it was developed uh, a number of years ago at Facebook, but I think it's, it's now um, becoming a lot more mainstream and, and approaching uh, kind of a critical mass of, of tools and um, frameworks that, that leverage it, right, in a way where most people can see a way where it might help them out. And the reasons for this are many. Um, so we're going to talk uh, first about what GraphQL actually is. So GraphQL is a query language for your API. And I took this paragraph directly from the GraphQL's website. Uh, it's a great description. And essentially, um, GraphQL is a, lang a query language for APIs and a runtime for fulfilling those queries with your existing data. GraphQL provides a complete and understandable description of the data in your API, gives clients the power to ask for exactly what they need and nothing more, makes it easier to evolve APIs over time, and enables powerful developer tools. So this is, this is awesome. That's a lot. Uh, so let's break it down in pieces. Essentially starting with the query language for APIs. What this means is that GraphQL uh, provides a way for you to request data with queries. If you've worked with a RESTful API, you can hit a REST endpoint and pull back some data, right? You hit, you hit an endpoint with a particular method, and the API will send you data back. With GraphQL, you send a query to a GraphQL endpoint, and it sends you data back. That's the kind of analogous relationship between the two. It's a runtime for fulfilling those queries with your existing data. Right? So getting a GraphQL server up and running uh, doesn't mean that you have to uh, you know, replace your API or change how you're doing your, your uh, data lookup. Right? Um, GraphQL is a analogous to REST, right? It's not a database. Uh, it's not a, a graph database. But what it allows you to do is adapt any existing data source to uh, query and pull back the data that you need. It's just set up a bit differently than probably the REST uh, APIs that you're used to. GraphQL provides a complete and understandable description of the data in your API. This description comes from the schema definition language. We'll see examples of this in a few. 
But uh, the basic point is that it provides you a way to write out the relationships in a similar way to how you might um, have a Swagger doc generated from a RESTful API. Uh, GraphQL uh, can provide you a way to actually write that kind of relationship description between the different types that you're working with uh, first and provide that as the description. And what this does is it gives a level of kind of documentation and uh, an understandable description that you can use and your tools can use. And again, there's that tools concept, uh, and we'll see what that means in the con in the whole context of GraphQL here shortly. It gives clients the power to ask for exactly what they need and nothing more. Um, this has to do with the concepts of underfetching and overfetching. Underfetching has to do with um, when you might go to an API and, for example, pull back a list of users, right? But what your app actually needs are the user details for each user, right? In a traditional REST API, you would have to find the users, right? And maybe you'd get a list of IDs back for a particular list. And then you'd need to go back to the API for each of those users, right? Requesting user details by ID you know, for each one. And what you've effectively done in that case is underfetched. Your, apps, your app needs a good amount of data and you've not gotten enough the first time. So you have to go back to the API again and again to get the rest of it. Now, the alternative is, let's say that you are requesting data for one of those users and your REST API would return the ID, the first name, the last name, the birth date, the favorite color, the dog's name, um, any random properties that you know comprise that user in your data model, right, in your domain. Um, but your app actually only needs the first name and last name to show a little profile uh, list item or something like that. Now, with REST, you're essentially overfetching. You're grabbing too much data and sending it back. With GraphQL, you're allowed to query for only the data that you need. So you can get a bunch of nested data if you want with one request, but you can also grab only the data that you need with one request, requesting only the first name and last name, for example. Um, at scale, this can end up impacting users that may be on a metered data plan or something similar um, who don't need all of that extra data. So you don't have to pay the cost of shipping it over your network, and the user doesn't have to pay the cost of uh, you know, receiving it on their device. This makes it easier to evolve APIs over time. So this is another aspect of GraphQL, and this mainly refers to the built-in deprecation functionality. So as opposed to with a REST API, needing to uh, version uh, a particular endpoint, or even version the API itself at the root, you can easily deprecate features in GraphQL um, and deprecate fields that you don't need anymore. We'll see an example of this later, but it provides you a way to slowly change your API in a way that is less impactful for clients of the API and provides even helpful information about why those changes are being made. And then lastly, it enables powerful developer tools. Again, there's the tools word. And frankly, this all sounds like a, a great kind of upgrade to REST, right? These different features that I've gone over. Compared to REST, I think they're um, a great win. But even if none of them existed, I still contend that I think the developer tool advantage alone is what really provides a benefit here. Um, these things are all, they're all great, right? All the features are, are nice, but the powerful developer tools that we'll see examples of here uh, really drive home what you can accomplish when you have a, a type system that goes from your API into your component code.
right? So that's a lot, right? What does this actually look like? For that, we'll go to a demo. Okay, so here's the demo app. Um, it's the simplest of movies. We have uh, some movies. We have now playing in popular sections. You can click on these movies. You can see the description and you can toggle the favorite. Pretty simple. Um, basic list manipulation, as I mentioned previously. Um, but to get the idea of how this is put together, um, both the front end and the back end, let's take a look at the code. So, most people, um, depending on where you're coming from, might only have experience with uh, maybe an API or an app, maybe not both. Um, for purpose of this talk, um, I'm going to have show an example that's going to have the API and the app. And we're going to explore um, all the different pieces of this and try and just connect together the broad strokes of how really the types all relate to one another, how these things are set up, how GraphQL can be used, and then how it can be used with a front end application to make your development experience better and less prone to errors. So I have this basic app running. I have an API and an app. Now, the API that we're going to look at is based on Express. If you've worked with uh, Node in the past, you might have familiarity with the Express framework for creating APIs. Um, the good news is that uh, if you do, GraphQL can fit right in. You can create a uh, server using GraphQL and leverage all the same Express stuff that you're used to. Now, I'm using a framework called Apollo, and Apollo Server allows you to set up a GraphQL API pretty easily using type devs. Now, what this actually refers to is the schema. So here's the schema. And this is the schema definition language that I talked about previously. We have some types. Similarly to what I looked at earlier with TypeScript, you can declare types in GraphQL schemas with the type keyword followed by the name. And you can set up this movie, for example, to have an ID, title, overview, so on. You can even nest types together. So you can have a cast of the movie, right? And each of these is a credit object. This exclamation point guarantees that the item won't be null, right? It's essentially required. The bracket syntax means that it's going to be a list. So this basically reads as having a list of credit items and guarantees that if there is a credit item in here, that it's not null. Already, if you think about this, you can see how kind of powerful this might be to guarantee the structure of your data that you're communicating with other APIs, client apps, to even have this level of structure and like rigor around the types that are available. This is referencing the credit type. Credit type has an ID, name, character, poster path, all right? This isn't required, so it doesn't have an exclamation point. But these things can relate to one another, you know, as we see. So that's all good. Next, we have the special kind of top level items, and that's query and mutation. Query is how you might get data. Mutation is how you might write data. So toggling a favorite movie, for example, passing a movie ID that you want to toggle as a favorite, it's pretty straightforward. You can think of these as, you know, basically declarations of different actions that you want to perform. We have hello, now playing, popular, movie by ID, and cast. And these just basically define the operations. Now, suppose the definition, right? We also want to know about the implementation, right? So how do these actually work? In our server, we actually pass the resolvers as well. Resolvers are here. 
you can see that these top level items, query and mutation, for example, align with these top level items, query and mutation. And that's on purpose. It's because hello now playing popular line up with hello now playing popular. You could think of these uh, analogous to REST controller methods. If you had a REST controller for a particular movie, you might have you know, a method to get the now playing, you might have a method to get popular, you might have a method to get movies by a particular ID. And just like a controller method uh, in a REST API, you might you know, go say to a service that you want to get some particular information. Right? And then that service might go to a database you know, whatever kind of in-tier architecture you're using, you can do the same types of structures in a GraphQL API. It's merely the kind of how the schema and the resolvers relate to each other that makes the difference here. So if we have this set up, how does it look like to actually use the GraphQL API? Well, it looks like this. Now, Apollo comes with GraphQL Playground, which is this interface that you see here. GraphQL Playground essentially allows us to set up a GraphQL endpoint and add a GraphQL, um, for a GraphQL API, you're not hitting separate URLs per resource like you are with a REST API. You're merely sending different queries to the same endpoint. So in this case, I can say hello. And if I hit play, it'll send back this data. If I make an adjustment, adjustment to the actual item, It'll actually tell me that this is incorrect and even provide me help. I can hit control space and it'll auto complete for me. So that's pretty nice. Again, the types here make all the difference because we're able to say, for example, that we want, um, maybe we want to know what other queries are available. So we can go over here and look at the schema tab. The schema tab should look familiar because this is uh, this, these are the same types that we looked at previously. We have the movie, the cast, mutation, query. So that's great. We get our, our little automatic documentation here. Um, you know, if we weren't in control of the API and wanted to see what the schema was like, we'd be able to, as long as we had access, of course. And we also have docs. So docs are great because you can click through and kind of discover and explore. You can even search if you want. We can click on any of these and it will tell us what the API returns. Now you can get kind of close to this with Swagger, right? But if you've used Swagger in the past, you know that you either have to auto-generate this information, which means that the Auto generation, you know, the actual generation process has to be performed and kept up with. Or if you annotate with Swagger, those annotations could be incorrect. And then your documentation doesn't actually match the API that you're working with. With GraphQL, you get around that problem because the introspection is what it's called. The introspection of your, of your uh, server actually generates this data. So you can click on now playing, for example. And like we saw before, it's returning uh, a list of type movie. And then the type movie, we can even click into here and get a, a further exploration down to the credit level. And we see the types at each. I mentioned deprecation earlier. We even have the ability to see that popularity has been deprecated. It even tells us to use favorite. And we can annotate that in our schema here by just assigning a directive. This is what I meant earlier when it says you can kind of um, gradually modify your API. So if we wanted to use this, we could also hit control space and explore the now plane. It's gonna immediately tell me that, oh, I, I need to have a selection of subfields. And this is nice because this structure gives us autocomplete. So we can say that I want ID title overview, for example. And I can hit play, and this will go to my API and pull back the data. 
Now you can see that this structure, this is the important part, the structure here matches the structure here. For each item, I have ID, title, and overview. Now this is huge because I'm able to request exactly what I want and nothing more. If I get rid of overview and hit play again, all the items are updated. So as the client, I get to request what I need from the API. I'm not just arbitrarily sent data from a RESTful API response. This is powerful um, for all of the kind of nice overfetching, underfetching reasons that I mentioned before. But as we go forward, we'll see how it's powerful for the type system. I can also pass variables to these. So we'll see if I want movie by ID, I can also get autocomplete here. And I can say that I want, for example, my ID to be this. And ID and title, I want my um, cast. So I can even go into cast and get a further drop down of items, get just their names. And if I run this request, I get the ID and the title just as I just as I want. And the structure follows exactly the cast. And then for each of them, I have the name. So this is how you interact with the GraphQL API. If you um, if you were to see the uh, request for this, it's just HTTP requests. Um, it's nothing special. Most of the requests ends up being uh, post requests. Um, and it's a bit beyond this how you might do uh, you know, error handling and whatnot. Um, but there are plenty of resources online where you can dig in a little deeper for those aspects. So great. That's our server. Um, the code and slides for this, by the way, will be available afterwards. If anyone wants to uh, have a look at the implementation here, play around with it, you know, dig in a little more. So at this point, let's move on to the front end. So we know how to, how to operate, make queries, um, get data, right? So how, how does this actually work and how does it look within you know, an, an actual app? So I have, I have a React app. Um, you know, and as we saw the example, it displays a list of movie posters. And the now playing essentially returns this list. And if you want to view the individual ones, you can see the details in the cast list for an individual movie. Now, here, this is um, the now playing uh, component. And what this is doing is using a hook. Now, if you're familiar with React, you'll know that uh, hooks are how you would basically set up fetching data. If you've used um, any, any really framework like React Query or SWR or uh, Redux, any of the kind of main you know, players in the space will often return to you um, a nice structure that represents the data that you may have gotten, the error and or the loading indicators. So this is a pretty simple um, basic use of this. Now, this hook, um, we'll get into in a minute, but this is going to return data. And the neat part about this is that because I'm using TypeScript, um, I'm able to get actual autocomplete from my data. And we'll see how this is done in a minute. But this is really powerful because we can know based on our GraphQL API what our data is going to be as we're coding our app. So if I look at now playing, I can see that um, it, this is noted as a list. I can map over this list, and I can get individual movies where it's able to tell me the properties that are on the movie. If I were to try and access the properties on the movie, I'll actually get autocomplete to show what's available. I'll even be able to show what's basically guaranteed to be there, like ID versus the items that are um, possibly not there. 
like favorite, which has a question mark. This is really popular or really uh, fundamental to, to being able to access and make sure that your app won't have runtime errors because if something is optional, you can be sure to check it. The code can tell you that it might not be there. So you don't end up shipping runtime errors. So as we saw, um, we can visit the movie poster uh, item and this movie poster item can essentially say, you know, we're going to have a, a movie fragment that shows us, uh, you know, the movie type that we want, right? So the movie that's on our props uh, comes in and has certain properties on it. For example, the favorite property. If we can hover over here and see that it's possibly a Boolean. Um, or null or undefined. So that's great because we can know what our actual type is. Now, where do these come from? Right? Where are the types actually made? Where this comes from is here. And this now playing uh, structure. So this query here is denoted by this GQL, GQL, which for the server, I was using Apollo server. For the client, I'm using Apollo client. What this allows us to do is make a query that looks, you know, nearly like this. If we go back to our now playing, you can see that you basically say the name of the query and the items that you want from that type. Here we have now playing and we have the items that I want from that type. From this, we can even get help, right? I can actually plug in this uh, server and use it within my editor. So I'm actually getting live server help telling me that this field is deprecated as I'm using it. I don't have to get you know, an error or a message from the server. I can get it right here in my editor as I'm developing. That's super powerful. I can get autocomplete. I can get errors when something is incorrectly spelled. That's all super powerful as well. And this is all accomplished via a code generator. Now, I'll give the basic rundown of this, but essentially this GraphQL code gen file can be used to look at our schema and generate code from it. So I can tell it, you know, look at the schema that I have that you can download from your server, or you can put, point an, act, an actual server. And you can say, hey, um, go look at all of the uh, GraphQL documents that I have. For example, this one. And say, you know, take all of these GQL items and generate types for me. Um, that's super powerful because if we um, if we end up uh, changing one of these things, we end up being able to impact our actual code, right? So, for example, if I have my uh, movie poster um, favorite, and this prop is based on this movie fragment. This movie fragment is based on the generated GraphQL code. So if I were to use this favorite and say, you know, I don't actually want to deprecate popularity. Um, we need to get rid of favorite and use that instead. And if I update this, I'm going to end up getting a regeneration of those types. And you can see it pop here, but you can also see the result pop here. And what this means is that as I change the queries that I'm using, I'm getting feedback in my editor immediately telling me that the item that I was using, favorite, it no longer exists. I took it out, right? So maybe I did this by accident. Maybe I did it on purpose. Regardless, because this won't compile, I can't ship this error to production. My app won't build. Using TypeScript in this way, can guarantee these types of 
um, linkages between the data that you're working with and the uh, API, like the, the resulting components that you're using, right? So if I put this back and hit save, my code gen will refire, my TypeScript will pick it up, and my error goes away. The implications of this are massive, and this is the huge breakthrough that I really, that really struck me and, and allowed me to realize the potential of using these types, both TypeScript and GraphQL together to make uh, an application uh, much more solid and provide immediate feedback um, in development. And these types of errors, you can eliminate entire classes of things by using these techniques. So, where do we go from there, right? The bigger picture. So there are adoption uh, and learning curve, um, you know, hurdles to get over with these approaches, right? Learning TypeScript, learning GraphQL. It can be uh, uh, a big lift to get started, but uh, I want to address a couple, you know, common questions and, and thoughts about the overall uh, landscape. That is, one, especially with TypeScript, it won't take longer to develop features, right? Um, I would say that, like tests, uh, adding types can appear like extra overhead, right? Especially when you're getting started. You know, if you if you write uh, just tests for React or or uh, you know any any sort of unit testing or integration testing, um, learning that, picking it up to begin with, can feel like uh, more work. Um, I mean, it technically is more work, right? It's more code that you have to write. But the long-term benefits of this, right, end up being that you are less prone to regressions in software. Um, you're more sure about the behavior of your code. And I'd argue that types can uh, add a lot of the same benefits. And even remove tests, because when you're using JavaScript, there's a lot of kind of defensive coding that you might have to do, right? Guaranteeing that uh, an item passed to a function, for example, is you know a string and not a number, right? Or having to make sure that you cast or convert some value to another uh, in certain cases. If you use types, the functions are guarded already at compile time. So you don't need those tests. You don't need those conversions. You just need to pass the correct thing to the function. Uh, so types can actually take the place of tests in some cases. Um, and, but you know, tests should not take the place of types. So, and, and another, another common thing that I run into is that people have tried TypeScript before uh, and it was a pain. Um, you know, has anything changed? And I would say that if you haven't taken a look at this in the past couple of years, go ahead and take another look. Uh, it has improved drastically, uh, even in just the past couple of years. Um, you know, even, even I, uh, being a big fan of TypeScript and, and React, knows that, that a few years ago, you know, the React support for TypeScript wasn't fantastic. Um, uh, now, now it is. Um, so much so that uh, the TypeScript adoption, um, the ecosystem has moved very quickly. Um, and I'd even argue that the libraries that you might find, you know, both server-side and client-side JavaScript, the ones that are using TypeScript are usually the ones to look for anymore. It's a good marker of kind of project hygiene to say that if if they've adopted TypeScript, it's probably a decent library. If they haven't, you might want to reconsider. Um, most libraries that are worth it have kind of boarded the TypeScript train uh, so far. And many organizations have too. So one more point I'd like to make is this is a uh, regarding TypeScript. Um, I got this chart from Rollbar, and essentially it navigates or, or lists a, a, a range of issues. Um, and I would say that if you, if you look at this, you end up having uncaught type error. And this is like the, the type of projects that run into these particular errors, right? The number of them. Uh, undefined is not an object. Null is not an object. Undefined is not a function, right? I'm sure if you've done any front-end development, you've seen these a billion times. Uh, and if you use TypeScript, 
um, you cannot read property length. If you read, if you use TypeScript to uh, its fullest, these are entire classes of errors that uh, just won't happen anymore. Um, that can save you a ridiculous amount of time and just frustration and having to deal with um, common issues. Right, so the TLDR, uh, use types, avoid any, mostly generated. Uh, these three rules will really get you the kind of the 80-20 of how to work with um, TypeScript. And once you leverage it with GraphQL, you really end up with a combination that's greater than the sum of the parts. All right, again, types equal tools. Um, for you, for your editor, for your teammates, uh, allowing to communicate these behaviors and um, structures uh, kind of end to end really makes all the difference. Um, so here's some quick resources. Obviously, the TypeScript Lang website, uh, the GraphQL website, How to GraphQL is a great resource. Um, and if you'd like a, uh, an idea of whether TypeScript would be, would be good for you, I put together a quick tongue-in-cheek website at shouldiusegraphql.com. You can visit and see whether um, GraphQL is a good choice. Um, relatedly, I also have a couple of Pluralsight courses uh, building React apps with TypeScript. Uh, this will get you an introduction to converting an existing application uh, to TypeScript. Also, securing a GraphQL API with Apollo. This runs through a full stack Apollo app and secures it using JWTs and or cookies. And we'll teach you uh, all the ins and outs of query complexity and GraphQL basics. Um, I have uh, trial codes for this. You can reach out to me on you know, Twitter, LinkedIn, whatever, uh, after this, if you'd like uh, any codes for that. Other than that, I appreciate all your time. Thank you very much for listening.